<laughs> Merry Clickmas! Yeah, anyway, this festive week we have cars, dogs, astronauts, and lots and lots of singing Furbies. <laughs> Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree, your leaves are so unchanging. Oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree, your leaves are so unchanging. Not only oh, you finally arrived. Welcome, the gang's all here. You are too. So welcome to Clickmas 2019. Yay! Forced merriment and pretend food, just like last year. Do we have a festive feast of tech treats for you? Yes, we do. And first up this year, it's going to be Lara. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Well, whenever people say you should never work with animals or kids, I think clearly they haven't worked with tech because it goes wrong occasionally, doesn't it? Just a little, yeah. yes. Have you noticed? Yeah. Yeah, well, this week I haven't just worked with tech, I've worked with a dog at the same time. Take a look at this. Meet Rusty, the tech-savvy puppy familiar with being caught on camera and provided with smartphone-triggered treats via this gadget already in his home. One of the first things we bought, perhaps before he actually came home with us, was the Furbo, which um, films him all the time, tells you when he's barking, tells you when he's whining, and um, if you want to give him a bit of a treat, you can click the treat release button and then he gets lots of treats sent to him. Want to test some gadgets? I take it that's a yes. Today he's my furry glamorous assistant, getting his teeth into testing tech. The rechargeable Wicked Ball moves, vibrates and changes colour according to activity level whilst playing. It's developed to encourage attraction and response. I do worry a bit when he picks it up in his teeth and it's vibrating in his teeth. GPS trackers for dogs have been around a while now, but they are getting smaller and lighter. The Joe Bit is water resistant and does better on battery life than some of its competitors. It also has a geofence function, so you can get an alert if your pet pooch goes further than it should. But how useful did Camilla find it? It's great that it's a GPS tracker, it's very small, but it is just a GPS tracker. Um, and I would have loved to have had some activity tracker with it. But it's very accurate and seems to have been correct every time I've checked. I wouldn't find it overly useful because um, I know where he is most of the time. In the case of your dog getting stolen and they are wearing it, I'm sure that would be extremely useful. Being able to track our animals has stepped up a level though. Now you can also track their behaviour as well as their activity. So you can see how the two things correlate. Beautifully behaved, of course, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> the Animo Pet Activity and Behaviour Tracker logs a doggy's step count and sleep, as well as alerting its owner as to how much barking, shaking or scratching is going on. OK, a calm moment, but there doesn't seem to be any lack of activity today, although you do need to collect at least a week's worth of data to start to see anything meaningful. The negatives, though, are you have to keep it on at night time, and I personally don't like keeping a collar on Rusty at night time. I don't think it's particularly safe. <laughs> So depending on a dog and its owner's lifestyles, it seems that different gadgets would be useful. But one Rusty. thing that is for certain is that before I film Rusty. anything like this again, I think I need a spot of human Rusty. training. OK, we'll play with this with you if you'll let me hold on to it. 
That was Lara with the dogs. I guess the only thing you need to be thankful for is it wasn't cats. Maybe next year. That's true. Now, Christmas is all about getting together with friends and family. And I don't know about you lot, but I kind of feel like we're family by now. Yeah. Pretty much. We, we've mm, known each yeah. other an awful long time. We <laughs> bicker. <laughs> we're dysfunctional. But we've seen each other through some ups and downs, some good times and bad times. And a few months ago, one member of the Click family got dealt some difficult news. LJ, tell yes, us about it. It was me. I got diagnosed with breast cancer a few months back. Not the most fun I've had. However, chemotherapy has some surprising bits of technology involved. And I thought, why not demystify it and give people the chance to see what actually happens? I've got tea, iPad colouring pencils, charging cable, keyboard, two kinds of drink, headband, I think that's most things. So this is my eighth chemo treatment out of ten. I'm ready to rock now. Everything starts with tablets. So lorazepam is to help with dealing with the pain of the cat because it's very, 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 very cold. Bottoms up. Right, lunch menu. Today I'm going to have what I always have. This is where my port has been implanted. It's a fast-track tube under my skin that connects directly to my heart, allowing nurses to administer drugs really easily. Like plugging in a phone charger. As a piano player, I really didn't want to have any um, catheters in my hands or in my arms. The, the chemo treatment's quite toxic. So when I found out that you could get a port fitted and everything just goes in here, I don't have to hunt around for a vein, it's Massive relief. Big breath. Didn't feel a thing. So now this is in, that's it, everything goes in and out of the port. Before I started chemo, I was really scared and I was also uninformed about the actual practicalities of it, the ins and outs of it, what to expect. Like wearing a cold cap, chemo kills any rapidly dividing cells, including hair, so lowering blood circulation to my scalp can help keep my hair on. Imagine eating the coldest ice cream in the world for about an hour and a half, and that gives you a good idea. All right, so off comes the wig. Here we go. Au naturel, albeit with quite a lot of makeup. Some patients keep more than others. I've been quite lucky. Do your thing. Tepid water is applied. And this is to help the conductivity of the cold cap. If you have even one treatment without the cap on, you can't do it, and then your hair will come out. It has to fit very snugly. I always had a theory that wearing a cold cap would make my brain really fast, like superconducting, but it's completely the opposite. I am unable to do much concentrating. Ooh. Bring on the winter. Okay, this is the painful bit. If I can get through this, then we're all good. So I have various things to keep me busy. Things I've found that are really enjoyable are watching mindless TV and doing flight simulator practice. I've always wanted to learn to fly a plane. Why not do it now? Slowly bring the nose up. There we go. This is really taxing with the hat on. I can do this with no problem when I'm not wearing it. I can't actually land the plane whilst I'm having the treatment done. I've crashed every time. I'm getting colder. <laughs> so I'm slightly impaired at this point, but colouring in clouds, that I can do. I've been using apps like this one, Procreate, Masterclass and the X-Plane Sim during the treatment, but I've also been recording my data to show oncologists what my body has been up to. I record what the data's track here, like blood pressure, and also collect data myself, like my resting heart rate and body temperature. Three days after treatment, I go up a few degrees. It's really useful. I can then go to the doctor and show them physical evidence of what my body has been doing. It's completely frozen solid now. <laughs> Sometimes there's ice in there. Can't remember anything anymore. After a few hours of IV and a cold head, I'm nearly done for another week. Thank you so much. So that's it. That's chemo treatment in a nutshell. Lots of different IV drugs, cool cap, port, and now hospital lunch. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> really brave. Thank, Thank you. you. 
but I had no idea about what goes on. This is exactly why I did it, because it feels like an opportunity to just lift the lid mm. on a single word and just maybe give people who are about to go through this the chance to just understand a bit more before going into it. And then it's not a whole lot of surreal surprises one yeah. after the other, which is kind yeah. of what it was like for me. I trust you to find all of the technology that you could oh, yes. in the procedure. Give me everything. <laughs> so you really know your way around social media. And I wonder whether social media has been a help, a hindrance, or whether it's contributed at all to, to your experience. I considered for such a long time, do I share this online mm -hmm. or do I not? And I decided to share it because I'm not the only person going through this. Mm -hmm. So many people are. The response I had was overwhelmingly good. So many people shared their stories with me and it feels like together we are stronger. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad I shared. LJ Rich, everyone. <laughs> oh, gosh. Thanks. Nice jumper. Thanks very much. Yeah, that's nice. Right, Laura, latch onto this. OK, I hope there's a good joke inside. Oh, that's oh, yours. Oh, there's, there's a car. Now, I believe this is a clue about what you filmed for the Christmas show, but it looks a bit small, quite compact. Yeah, it is small, but it's very clever. This is a scale model of the Robo car. And its makers say it's the fastest thing on four wheels with no driver. Ah, OK, so that's why there's no driver's seat in there. But are we looking at a future of racing cars with no drivers? Are we stuffed turkey? I don't know, it's like, it's been a year where it's autonomous this, autonomous that. I mean, before you know it, we're not going to be able to drive our own cars. We've got robots taking people's jobs. I mean, I think I've just about had enough. So when they told me that there was this robo car that could race a human and be quicker, I thought, right, let's take it to the home of British motorsport. It's time to make a point. Robocar isn't your average automated car project. The cabinless car isn't interested in traffic lights or junctions. It's built with one thing in mind, speed. Like a standard autonomous car, Robocar uses various sensors, including LiDAR, radar, and image recognition software to drive at race speeds. And by measuring lateral yaw, g-forces and grip levels, it's learning how to go faster all the time. Now, to fairly race the robocar, human versus machine is tricky, given there's nowhere for me to sit. So, to decide whether human or AI is the faster driver, we're going to race the model that does have a cockpit, which the developers use to test the software, suitably called DevBot 2. They didn't say what happened to DevBot 1. After a fairly sloppy outlap, I line up on pole position, hoping to post a respectable lap time for Team Human. Okay, let's see how we get on here. For safety reasons, the car's been limited to 100 kilometers an hour for both my drive and the AI's, but the acceleration is blistering and sitting five centimeters off the tarmac, well, it seems fast enough. Just missed that apex. All over the curb, come on, come on, let's get speed down. Would my full-on speed but wider line around the last corner, Luffield, be my undoing or my masterstroke? Time for the car to take the wheel. Whoa, and we're off. Oh my god! <laughs> it was quick on the brakes there, left that to the last minute. The car was harder on brakes and more sudden with the steering. It didn't care about my comfort, but was it quicker? Somebody tell me! Devil it's got to be man, right? It's got to be man. Devil, we're at 131.68 UV day, 128.53. A 128.53. I beat it by three seconds. Three seconds. Wow. Yes. Man wins over machine. Brilliant. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Simmons beating artificial intelligence, which must have made your year. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Dan. Love AI. I tell you what, 2019 has been an amazing year for space nuts everywhere. 50th anniversary of the first moon landings, our visit to NASA, Mark's visit to the world's first commercial spaceport. Oh, yeah. um, and I had the chance to review it all with a proper space nut, as in a nut that's properly been to space. It's only British astronaut Tim Peake. So earlier this year, we went to NASA to their HERA project, which is looking at how to get the right mix of people for long space missions. And yeah. they made the point that it's not just one type of person that you need. If you had a spaceship full of one type of person, that wouldn't work. So do you have any yeah. views on the type of mix that you need to have on board? Uh, yes, you do need a, a, a mix of different types of people on board but with a mixture of different skills. And this is going to be so much more important for the longer duration missions coming to the moon and to Mars, purely because you will want a medical doctor as part of that crew, I'm sure. Um, you'll probably want a trained geologist as well. Um, you'll want somebody who's an expert with piloting skills, um, but also in terms of personality and character as well. I think you've got to have people who are flexible. Um, somebody needs to be the leader, uh, and everybody needs to accept that. And you know, if you're all extremely strong personalities uh, who don't accept you know, the, the subordinate position very well, that's not gonna work. Which one were you? A mix. I think that's what, uh, same with my classmates as well. People who can take on the leadership roles, who can step up to the plate when it's needed, but also people who can instantly fall into a supporting role, come up with solutions. The ability to switch between the two is very important. Have you brought any of the astronauts back with you? Do you deal with life differently now to how you did before? Um, yes, it, I'm, I'm, I've always been quite calm. I think I'm even more so, having flown in space. Um, and sometimes I've thought to myself, you know, Pete, you did a spacewalk, I'm sure you can do this. <laughs> you know, and I, I've had to give myself a bit of a talking to and think, yes, you know, you're actually right, I can do this. 2020 could possibly be the year when space tourists begin to take their first flights. That's what we've been told in the last mm -hmm. 12 months. I wonder if you think space is a place for tourists? I think we need to be careful about who we're sending into what environment with what level of training and who's looking after them. Um, it's a bit like when you, if you go scuba diving, for example, um, it's okay to go scuba diving as a novice if you're with an instructor who knows what they're doing and can get you out of a situation. Same with space flight. It's okay to go into space if you're uh, you know, a, a tourist or a space flight participant if you are with professional astronauts who know what they're doing. We're not asking them to do spacewalks. We're not asking them to capture cargo vehicles with a robotic arm. We're not asking them to handle uh, technical you know, problems that might occur. We're asking them to know how to look after themselves in an emergency, how to understand their spacesuit uh, and the basic life support systems. So a much reduced training package. If you were king of the world, but you had to face the realities of you know, business making money and poorer nations becoming richer nations. How would you curtail what we are doing to the environment? Going green doesn't mean not making money and it doesn't mean stopping countries that are poor, you know, improving their quality of, of life. We just need to make the decisions to do it. If we invest in technology, then the, the cost comes down and the efficiency goes up. Um, I mean, for example, what we're doing with small satellites is because the satellites are reducing in size, so the solar panels are reducing in size, so the efficiency of the solar panels have to go up. So space is one of those environments that is forcing industry to improve the efficiency of solar panels. Then you end up with efficient, cheap solar panels, and then suddenly, you know, solar panels on roofs become acceptable and become the norm and generate far more electricity. So there are so many applications for this. It, it is a case of changing minds and making that initial step, that initial decision to do something. Oh, God. Tim, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you Thank so you very much for your time. Thank you. The amazing Tim Peake there, the equally amazing Mark Chislak here, especially because <laughs> he's absolutely pacing me at Street Fighter. What are we playing this on, well, This Mark? is my Christmas present to myself. It's a Capcom <laughs> arcade stick. It's got 16 classic retro arcade games right. in one giant controller. The beauty of this is the controller is almost exactly the same as the kind of thing 
would find on an arcade cabinet. So you can have the same experience that you had in the 80s, except you don't have to do it in a horrible, stinky, dirty arcade with sticky floors, and you don't need to use hundreds and hundreds of 50p's. You haven't been to my living room. Um, <laughs> good year for gaming, would you say, this year? Yeah, an interesting year. Uh, we've had Google trying to persuade us that we're going to get rid of our consoles and get into video game streaming with their service Stadia, which is great if you have an amazing internet connection. If you don't have an amazing internet connection, then it doesn't work. And we've been saying that for many years now, haven't we? Yeah. And we're still not there with it. Yeah, there's a couple of, uh, a couple of companies that have been trying video game streaming for quite some time, and yet the infrastructure is just not there. Um, brilliant. OK. Omar, over to you. Here you go, Laura. Oh, thanks, Merry Omar. Christmas. That's so nice that you thought of me. Dan's just eating a chocolate. Can I open it? Yeah, go for it. Wow. Oh, it's a Furby. Thank you. That's a bit of a blast from the past. Yeah, well, it's not a cutting edge gadget that we're used to seeing on the show, but I did go to see a YouTuber that's breathing a new lease of life into old tech like this. Oh, sounds fun. <laughs> Wake up sleepy heads, do your teeth, make the sheets, read the news. This is Sam Battle, otherwise known on YouTube as Look Mum, No Computer. With over 240,000 subscribers on the platform, he showcases musical instruments and other weird inventions that he's created using old tech and only old tech. Be it a Lego Star Wars orchestra. A flamethrowing Henry Hoover. Or even a choir of these cute little terrors. Oh, hey! That sounds demonic! Oh, it is demonic. But what else has he got in his studio? This is basically a 48 Game Boys, and it basically sounds like an orchestra. For instance, But after a quick modification, yeah. the keyboard doesn't just play Game Boys anymore. <laughs> I was very close to that. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. Yeah. I get it, I get it. That's awesome. Are you, is your hair okay? Bye. He also has a bike that, when pedaled, powers a synthesizer. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> right, let's uh, let's give that another go. I'm making music. This is the most musical I've ever been. Hold on to me, Sam. Come on. Hold on. That's it. <laughs> so what is it about old tech that fascinates him so much? It just looks so much better and it's easy to modify and hack the modern things. The problem with modern pieces of equipment is it's usually made to be very small and compact and stuff and it's not easily um, hackable, it's not easy fixable. <laughs> ah, I found a problem! Sam mainly uses eBay to buy all of this old tech for as cheap as possible. But it's not only about cost. This is a piece of history, for instance, this wall is um, pieces of technical scientific equipment from universities that they didn't require anymore because there's better versions now. These are from the 1950s and it's just, they're beautiful and you can buy these for like 20 quid. It's also recycling, reusing things that instead of them going into the landfill and stuff like that. And I don't know, something about classic uh, design and engineering is very attractive to me. I also look like a ton of fun, Omar. It's the best shoot I've had all year. Fantastic. Omar and look, Mum, no computer. Finishing off this year's Clickmas special. I hope you've enjoyed being here as much as we've enjoyed making it for you. But that's it now. Next week, you can see highlights of Click Live, which we filmed last month in Scotland. And in the meantime, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can contact us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or Twitter, at BBC Click. Who's manning it over Christmas? Um... Okay, good luck with that. In the meantime, thanks for watching and Merry Clickmas! Merry Christmas.